good morning. That's a hard act to follow. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Belgian citizen. And um, so um, we make chocolate in Belgium. So that's the, most of the business we do. But, uh, you know, I, I never really cared of becoming an American citizen. Um, now, perhaps I should do it, right? I know how, who to vote for. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was a pretty impressive uh, uh, vision that was sketched out there. Um, so we had this morning, we had some presentation about the brain, about the heart, about politics. Uh, but we are in Silicon Valley, so I think probably there should be a little bit also about silicon uh, being uh, presented here. And it, it's a little bit, that's my role that I would like to play here. Uh, I'm the CTO of uh, Xilinx, which probably most of you have never heard of. It's, it's a $3 billion public company down the road here in San Jose. Um, and um, when you're using the internet, basically, your data is being processed by our chips. We are mainly sitting in the infrastructure uh, that enables uh, all the communication and the connectivity uh, that's necessary to build the internet on. So um, it's from that context, basically, that I would like to share you a little bit of um, you know, the vision that we have. The mission of our company is actually building the adaptable, intelligent world. And you know, our marketing guys, of course, came up with the adaptable, intelligent AI, right? Uh, which seems to be fashionable, but there is definitely some truth in, in, in these words, especially about adaptable and intelligent technologies. First of all, I think um, uh, despite you know, some of the uh, scenarios that, that, that we see in front of us, uh, we are in very exciting times now when I talk technology and I talk business. There's a lot of opportunities coming towards us. Um, we see you know, clearly uh, some big megatrends that uh, are definitely uh, building on top of the capabilities of the silicon roadmaps. First of all, there is the cloud infrastructure that creates hyperscale uh, data centers that are um, dealing with the processing of literally zettabytes of data that are being produced uh, by the internet. And then on the other side, you see a lot of um, automation happening. Um, whether we like it or not, it's happening, and the, the key uh, example of that was discussed before. The autonomous driving is definitely uh, a trend where in Silicon Valley here we play a major role in, in, in uh, moving that forward. And then you have the 5G wireless which is happening, which is then connecting all these devices, billions of devices, and allows us to get wireless bandwidth we could only dream of a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of you know, momentum in the industry and a lot of opportunities that are being created and all of that is leveraging uh, the silicon technology. Now, um, what's important is that um, underneath the hood of all of this, there are three very important emerging technology uh, trends that are enabling all of that um, and um, that are going in the near future to some pretty exponential changes. First of all, I think um, clearly as we have all these connected devices, all these devices are going to create tons and tons of data. So Cisco, for example, uh, forecasts that in uh, 2022, um, all these devices that are connected to the internet will generate something like 4.8 zettabyte data you know, per year. Now, that's more data in one year that's being created than there has ever been created since the existence of the internet you know, before 2022. So that's the kind of um, enormous amount of data that uh, uh, that's been made available for us to potentially build upon to uh, do good things with it, but as has been said, also potentially bad things. Um, now, another aspect is if you look at all these business trends, whether it is uh, the wireless connectivity with 5G, whether you talk about cloud computing, whether you talk about autonomous driving, artificial intelligence or more specifically, the way we look at it today, which we refer to as machine learning, is a foundational technology that is not just 
you know, a fashionable term, it's a foundational technology that will shape the world and that will change how we do things and what we can do. And then the third thing is, of course, is the, the foundation on which Silicon Valley has been built, which is more slow. Now, here we see some trends that are a little bit more scary, but on the other hand, create opportunities. Everybody start talking about, you know, can more slow continue uh, to, uh, to happen? Um, we can now basically integrate, you know, more than 10,000 transistors on the tip of a human hair to put that in perspective. How far, at a certain moment, you reach the physical limits of what you can do. And then, you know, we have to think about whether we can continue uh, to deliver the benefit that's, that Moore's Law has been bringing uh, to the table for a long time. So these are three technology trends that we see that are going to have a lot of impact in um, how we build systems in the future. Let's you know, go through them one by one. If you think about artificial intelligence the way it is today, artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. Actually, I did my PhD in artificial intelligence about 35 years ago, and at that time it looked like a very uh, crazy idea. And, and um, you know, actually what happened is then for 30 years we had something like we call the AI winter, because a lot of excitement and promises were created, nothing happened, but then AI, a couple of years ago broke through because suddenly the data was there to enable AI and also the compute power was there. And um, AI, it, it comes in many forms and shapes. Uh, there is, uh, you know, one of the technologies that is essential for artificial intelligence is something we refer to as deep neural networks. Now, deep neural networks are kind of a, a way in trying to mimic how the brain is making decisions and is computing data and, and dealing with data. And you do that, you know, basically using massive hyperscaler data centers to kind of um, try to mimic how the brain works. That's what neural networks is. But the problem with that is there's, there is no such thing as the one neural network for one application. If you just look at all these applications like image classification, detection of problems in machines and the likes, and object detection, there's a lot of, of uh, differentiation there. On top of that, you know, we are just at the in infancy of where this technology is going. We are really seeing that the uh, neural network technology and the algorithms that are coming with it are evolving at a blazingly fast uh, 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 speed. So every couple of months, people invent completely new uh, neural networks and algorithms to solve a specific problem. This is, for example, uh, all the bars are giving an indication of new technologies that, that came for solving one specific problem, which is recognizing what is in an image, right? Classification of an image. I mean, every two, three months, you have a, a technology that is wiping out the previous technology. And that brings a challenge for us in Silicon Valley because, you know, one of the challenges we have is when you build chips, it takes quite a long time to get a chip from a specification to a final product. Typically, it takes two, three years. Now, think about it. If you are a semiconductor company that is trying to uh, cater to these requirements, you start building a chip at a certain moment. It takes you two, three years to get into production. You probably went to something like 10 to 15 different generations of new technologies from the time you started building your chip. So by the time you have your product, your product is outdated. That's how fast AI is evolving right now and some of the challenges that we have here. The second uh, challenge is you know, the data center infrastructure. Um, whereas in the past, uh, when I was a kid, for example, I was in college, we, we talked about, not the data center, we talked about the compute center. Right. Everything was centered around compute, uh, around CPUs and, 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 and how much uh, compute power you had. These days, everything is centered around the data. Whether you built a good system or not depends on how you can handle the data in an efficient way. And every application has a different way of how the data is, is being monitored and, and moved around and things like that. So if you look at what's happening in the cloud and in the data center architectures, you see that 
the challenge is moving from the compute, which is traditionally something we have been used to, we are talking about computers, how fast they are, towards the network. That's why you see companies like NVIDIA has just bought a company like Mellanox, and you see my company, Xilinx, we just uh, you know, acquired SolarFlare, or gave the intention to acquire SolarFlare, given um, all the regulatory um, aspects of it. And so there is a big change, and actually what's happening is that, whereas in the past we were always thinking like the CPU is the computer, um, now what's happening is the data center is the computer. You, when you try to solve a problem, is you don't use like one computer, you typically solve thousand, uh, you, you, you use thousand computers to solve your problem. If you, for example, click on a Facebook page, what's happening is you, you basically fire off a bunch of uh, compute tasks in a data center that typically are occupying about thousand CPUs. Right? That's what's happening when you click on, on, an, on a Facebook image, on a Facebook page. So there is definitely some challenges there, but the problem you have is that this is a, a diagram which is uh, from Google, which shows if you, if you look at the different workloads in the data center, there's no one big workload in the data center that you can say, I'm going to build a data center for that task. You would think, you know, Google, it's search and most of their stuff, you know, is going to workload is going to be search. Well, if you look at that, search is responsible for 9.9% .9 of the workload of the data center. 90% of the uh, applications are, are, are different applications than, than search applications. So a data center, you cannot build this kind of one type of thing that solves all the problems. You have to have a very flexible uh, data center architecture, so you have to be adaptable. And then finally, when you talk about compute, a lot of the compute is moving to the, the edge, which is close to you know, where we are interfacing with this technology. It's, it's where we have the cameras, where we have the sensors, um, the devices that are generating the, the, um, you know, the data. And there's many reasons for that. Some of the reasons are you know, security or um, confidentiality or privacy and so on. And some of them are technical like latency. Um, now, interesting enough, if you look at the compute on the edge and the compute on the cloud, whereas they all have their roots in the same you know, place, which is started all with a desktop computer, uh, when you look at the figures of merit, what's important in terms of building hardware uh, to solve the compute problem in the edge or the cloud, it's very different. When you talk about a data center, it's typically all about as, as fast as possible. If you click on a search, command for, for Google, you want to answer as fast as possible. Now, if you're in the edge, like, let's take the example of an autonomous car or something like that. If you're in the edge, you first of all, you want your system to be real time, which means just fast enough. Because if you're too fast, you could say, well, who cares if you're too fast? Well, if you're too fast, it means, for example, you're over-designing your system and you're, for example, using more power than you should use to solve your problem. Now, think about a car. In the car, power is very important because within a couple of years, all the cars will be electrical. And so power consumption is going to be mileage and mileage is going to be a competitive factor that's playing. So you really want to have compute that is so efficient as, as, as possible. Um, you also want the compute in the edge to be very different than in the data center. In the edge, you want it to be deterministic, which means whenever you push the brake in your car, you want it to behave exactly the same way it did before. You really want, you know, don't want to have, you know, one time it takes a little bit longer to brake than the other time, or, you know, which you, we all have when we open a web page or something like that. We sometimes... Sometimes we have to wait a little bit longer, sometimes it's immediately, we don't really know why. Well, you cannot afford that on the edge. So there's definitely a lot of, of, um, of challenges there. Now, against the backdrop of all of that, we are seeing a challenge, which is that more slow, as we know it, is slowing down. This is um, a diagram from uh, Professor Hennessy, who is the president of Stanford, you know, where he basically advocates that 
This is how compute power over time, since the beginning of uh, Moore's law, has improved. And if you look at the traditional way leveraging Moore's law, we see that you know, it's slowing down. The evolution is slowing down. And the question is, what's going to happen after Moore's law? Um, and that, that basically is a golden, we as, as engineers see this as a golden age. This is a golden age of opportunities because we see one of the technologies that has been essential for us is now slowing down, which creates a lot of opportunities for innovation. And, and the innovation will be at both on the manufacturing technology side, it will be you know, on the architecture side, so the traditional CPU will probably st will still be around, but will be replaced in many places by different type of architectures, massive parallel architectures, um, that will be very different than what we are used to. And of course, that brings an extra challenge, which is a challenge for the software world, because ultimately you can build the best hardware in the world if you cannot unleash that full potential of the hardware by programming it and by having you know, software written for it, you really are facing a, a big challenge there. And so one of the things that we see is together with the revolution that we see on the hardware side and on the architecture side, we also see clearly a revolution happening on the software side in terms of what kind of software people are we seeing. We, we basically see a fork off between two categories of computer scientists, I would say. You have the people that really understand the hardware very well and that will really build very efficient functions on the hardware. It will be a limited group of people that can do that. They will be, um, they need basically both skill sets in understanding hardware and software. And then on top of that, you know, on, on the shoulders of giants, I would say, you will have a massive amount of people then that will use what we refer to as productivity software. This is the software that you know, your kids in high school will start using. Uh, it's um, you know, Python, it's uh, programming frameworks. I remember when I was in, 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 in university, um, there was a big step to move from one programming language to the other. I mean, that community will be so familiar in going into new programming environments, frameworks, and so on but they will have less knowledge about the underlying efficiency you know, of, of the hardware, right? So there is definitely a, a something happening there also on the software side. Now, what does that mean for, for the future? And, and uh, as I said, I'm, I'm of course in the technology side, I'm, I'm not really thinking about the philosophical consequences of all these things. Um, I have a lot of people that are uh, can, giving me guidance on that. But if you think about it, um, clearly, um, if there is one thing, Kurzweil, who's um, uh, a visionary, I would say, in the technology world, he has a law that he refers to as the law of accelerating returns. And what he says is that technology over the ages, from the very beginning of the evolution, has continued to deliver an exponential return. You know, we sometimes think about more slow as the one thing that has made everything possible. His statement is if you just look at the problem of compute, well, basically, you know, there has been an exponential return of the figure of merit, which in this case, in this diagram, is the calculations per second per thousand dollars. If you, if you think about it, more slow in that sense exists already, you know, more than a hundred years. And so, what, what he's saying is, as we look into the future, what we have seen made possible by Moore's law in terms of creating opportunities you know, uh, to grow uh, compute capabilities will continue. What will be the technology today? We don't know. Might be DNA-based DNA computing. It might be neuromorphic computing. It might be quantum computing. But there is a lot of opportunities there to explore to go to that next phase. And so what does that then finally mean if we talk about artificial intelligence? I think one of the challenges that we face, I think with artificial intelligence right now, is that um, we cannot explain, believe it or not, we cannot explain why AI works. Uh, I can give you an anecdote. We were working with a car manufacturer not so long ago on a driver monitoring system. 
And um, as always, you, you have to get your system to lower cost. And we were trying to see how can we get this to, to lower cost. And we just couldn't get it into the hardware that would fit into the cost uh, picture that, that uh, the customer had in mind. And we were trying and trying, didn't work. And finally, one of the engineers said, you know what? Why don't we just take one of the most expensive layers in the neural network and get rid of it and see what happens? Because that meet, meant less computation, you know, uh, less uh, costly hardware. So we did that, and actually the system worked better. And we had, we had no clue why. You know, but it worked better. So we got the cost in the end, but we have no idea why. And now you can imagine that's, that's sometimes challenging if you are going to use AI in dependable systems like autonomous driving. Today, you know, people you know, trust the AI systems because, well, to a certain extent because they are predictable, right? You have, they have worked well in a million other cases. So in the million plus one case, which is your case, they probably will work too, statistically, the chance. So that's how people think and trust AI today. But think about it, how people trust each other, right? Um, I would say, you know, I trust my wife a lot, right? But I wouldn't say she's predictable. Um, <laughs> and so the reason why I trust her is because I know what her values are. Now, this is different than how you trust today an AI system. And I think we have to start thinking about it, how you build trustworthy AI systems that can mimic, you know, uh, how we trust people, right? Especially if you think about, you know, the first speaker, what he was saying about what is going to be possible, we really need trust. Now, one, one aspect of trust is democratize the information. And that's another trend that you will see in the AI world. You will see a lot more open source. It's going to be essential because you need open source, you need the data that you use to build an AI system to be visible to people so they can trust it. They know that there is no bias in the data that you used um, and that therefore your system has a bias in, in taking decisions and so. And then ultimately, of course, you know, where a lot of the academic community is working on these days is, is how, you know, because today these, the AI systems only work as we call it, under supervised learning. You provide them a lot of data, and you tell them what the answer should be on that data, and then they learn from that. Ultimately, you want uh, systems that are independent and that can learn by themselves, and that's a lot, you know, uh, an interesting topic for the future. Thank you.